Thank you, Brother Colston. Whenever I get the opportunity to thank uh, the people that have invested in my life, I certainly like to do so. Uh, my family, my mom and dad came to the First Baptist Church just over 40 years ago. I was three years of age, and um, I'm glad I grew up in, in a home where my parents believed in this place, and uh, I had the opportunity to grow up with just some great people. And uh, for those of you that have been here for many years and have invested in my life, thank you for doing so. Uh, my, my son Jeff is, is our youngest, and he is in Brother Jerry Smith's Sunday school class. And um, Brother Jerry uh, taught me in Sunday school class, and um, I enjoy that. I enjoy that, that opportunity that I have here at the First Baptist Church of Hammond. And for those of you that are looking for a place to rear your family, uh, what a good place this is. And it certainly isn't a perfect place. And looking back through the years now as a parent, uh, I can see things maybe that took place in the lives of our family that as a parent would have caused me to scratch my head. And I'm sure in their private moments, my mom and dad may have scratched their heads at times. But I'm glad as a young person, I didn't know about it. Uh, I just was brought to church and was around some great people and great examples. And First Baptist Church, thank you for being that example in my life. And I'm challenged. Um, there are those of us that need to be the example for the next generation. And um, what a great week of Vacation Bible School. And for those of you that helped out this week, uh, thank you for doing that. Again, I had children in Vacation Bible School and had a chance to help out in Vacation Bible School. And what a lot of fun. Uh, it was fun to see Brother Wilkerson with the kids, whether it was the morning services here or the evening services out at, at the school. Uh, a lot of young people trusting Christ as their Savior. Uh, some got the assurance of their salvation, you know, and got it uh, repeated to them once again from the Bible, how they can know for sure they're going to heaven. What, what a great week. But Brother Colston led us in reading three verses here in James, verses 25, 26, and 27. And the topic of conversation is pure religion, and that'll be our topic of conversation this morning. I was talking with Peter Petropoulos and his wife Rachel some time ago and uh, Peter grew up here in this church and I knew that Peter and his family had worked at the Lake County Fair and have done so for for many years and I didn't know what Peter did at the fair so I just happened to ask him it was before Sunday school uh, one morning and I asked him so are you gearing up and your family gearing up to work at the fair and he said that they were and so I said well what do you actually do I mean what do you do at the fair and, uh, you know, Lake County Fair is a big deal around here. I listened to the radio this morning. Some guy grew a pumpkin over 1,250 pounds. How many of you heard that this morning on the radio? guess I'm the only one. Well, there's news for you. 1,250 pounds. You heard it, heard it from here, a big pumpkin. So the prize winner at the Lake County Fair. Well, it's a big deal around here. So I was talking to Peter, and I was asking Peter what his family did at the fair. And he said, well, we sell euros. Okay. Now, you probably understand what I just said. And, but what he was talking about was the Greek sandwich. I call them a gyro, okay? Maybe you call them gyros. I don't know. But when he said that, I thought he was talking about euros, the European currency. <laughs> and so I'm going into this conversation, picturing Peter and his family, many of you know the Petropolises, at a booth at the Lake County Fair, dealing in European currency, you know, right next to the 1,200 pound pumpkin, and this line of people bringing in their dollars and exchanging them for euros. Now this, it was one of the strangest conversations for about the next 30 to 60 seconds when my mind was on European currency and his mind was on Greek sandwiches and selling them at the fair. And he's telling me that they run out and they have to go get some more and they're always busy. One of the busiest booths at the fair until I realized, you're talking about Greek sandwiches. Like, yeah, what'd you think I was talking about? <laughs> Finally, we got on the same page and our conversation started making sense. When we talk about religion, I'm afraid that sometimes God's idea of what pure religion is and our idea of what pure religion is. Not, not ours as a First Baptist Church family per se, but ours as the human race. Our idea of what, human, uh, of what religion is and should be. 
are as far apart as a lamb sandwich and European currency. God defines what pure religion is. And I do believe it is our responsibility, if we care about what God thinks, to match our religion and our definition of religion with whatever God says pure religion is. And yours might be right in line with that, but just three very simple points this morning as we look at what pure religion is. Brother Colson read with us, and, and we read together verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Before we get to number one, if you wonder whether or not this verse is talking to you, if you're a member of the First Baptist Church of Hammond, this verse is talking to you. You seem to be religious, okay? If you don't believe me, ask your neighbor. They saw you leave Sunday morning last week, Sunday night, and then Monday night to vacation Bible school, Tuesday night to vacation Bible school, Wednesday night to vacation Bible school. In their mind, you went to church enough for the year. What are you doing back again this morning, okay? You seem to be religious, okay? This verse is talking to us. And it says, number one, if you seem to be religious, but you don't bridle your tongue, your religion is a waste, God says. So number one, God's definition of pure religion, number one, is a bridal tongue. Bridal tongue. You know, I've, I've been heard that life is just a constant repetition of the fundamentals. You know, even in coaching, I've heard coaches say, whether it's baseball or basketball, or whatever the sport is, that that sport is just a constant repetition of the fundamentals. If, uh, if you go to a major league game, you'll see before the game starts, batters taking batting practice, fielders grounding, you know, fielding ground balls. If you go out to one of our t-ball games, the First Baptist Church Little League, you know what you'll see before the game starts? You'll see batters taking batting practice and fielders taking fielding ground balls. That is, in order to be a good baseball player, it is a constant repetition of the fundamentals. And as we look at this topic, number one, a bridal tongue, I'm reminded of that because it comes up in Scripture time and time again controlling what comes out of your mouth. If you were just to continue reading in the book of James, you'd get to chapter 3, and that passage says your tongue is like the rudder on a ship. And even though it's such a small member, that rudder on that ship dictates where that ship ends up, just like your tongue will dictate your direction and even your destination in life. It is a fundamental of Christianity. It describes our tongue like a bridle on a horse or like a bit in the horse's mouth. How that, again, that bit decides what direction that horse goes. And again, those are my illustrations. Those are God's illustrations trying to get across to us this fundamental of pure religion. And that is you must control your mouth. You must control what you say. If you don't, even though you seem to be religious, according to scripture, your religion is a waste. Boy, we, we put a lot of work into this ministry, don't we? This week is a perfect example of the work that we put into our children, to the next generation, to this ministry. What a tragedy if that, all that work would be a waste. First of all, pure religion, according to Scripture, is a bridal tongue. You know, you might, you might think well, that's talking about vulgarity. There are certain words I should say. There are certain words, certain words I should not say. I would agree with that. I don't know, though, if that's exactly what this verse is talking about. Because if you say those other words, probably you don't seem to be religious, right? So my thinking is, this is a religious person who does what we do this morning, which is we're here in church, where we're supposed to be, that more possibly words of anger, criticism, gossip, come out of our mouth. And one of the reasons why I believe that, if, if, you, if you look up just a few more verses, it talks about our words and how our words shouldn't be words of wrath, James says. So I believe that's what it's talking about when it talks about a bridal tongue. You do understand how your words build or how they tear down. 
You know, it wasn't too long ago we were children. Do you remember that? Do you remember how, with just one statement, it seemed like your parents could take all the air out of you, just deflate you. And sometimes we needed to be deflated, right? But do you remember that? I remember standing in, I don't know where we were as a family, probably at Walgreens or someplace that had greeting cards. And I was just a little child, probably six or seven years of age. And I was with my four older brothers and sisters, my mom and dad, and they were all passing around these greeting cards and laughing at these different cards. Could you picture it at a Hallmark or at Walgreens, just at the greeting card aisle? I don't know how we ended up there as a family, but we were. Everyone's laughing, passing around these greeting cards. And I grabbed one. All I remember about that card is that it had a lion on the outside. I didn't even open it up to see what it said on the inside. And I nudged my dad like everybody else was doing, and I handed him that greeting card, laughing, watched for his reaction. And whatever it said inside that greeting card with the lion on the outside was not good. Okay, because the look that my dad gave me was like, and he put that card back. And again, he just let all the air right out of my spirit, you know, because that was my dad. Apparently, I needed deflating for whatever what that greeting card said. But do you remember how those words can affect you? Do you ever consider that when you use your words? Do you understand the importance of what you say? when it comes to our religion, when it comes to pure religion, when it comes to just being a fundamental Christian. You know, 1 Peter chapter 3 describes how to have a good day, how to enjoy life. There's four points there. You can look at it some other time. But of those four points, point number one, point number two, they're the same. Control your mouth. He that will love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil, number one, and his lips that they speak no guile. Again, if you want to have a good day, points number one and two, control your mouth. It's a fundamental of Christianity. I notice, according to God's definition of pure religion, number one, a bridal tongue. Number two, a benevolent spirit. It says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I notice a benevolent spirit. It outlines two groups of people there that we're supposed to be kind to. If you wonder what I'm doing, I put a handkerchief somewhere in this pocket. There you go. Surprise car keys, my wallet, my wife's hairspray, all this stuff was coming out of my pocket. And there we go. I found it. Okay. Benevolent spirit. You know, we read verse 25 with Brother Colston. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible for selfish reasons because it ends by saying, this man shall be blessed in his deed. That's us, right? I want God to bless me. You want the Lord to bless you. And since that verse ends in that way, I pay special attention to that verse. That verse says, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, I took this little parenthesis here for this reason. That verse is, is sort of like a snap of the fingers to me. As a junior high teacher for years, I, I learned how to snap my fingers because at any given time, normally there's things going on in a junior high classroom that are not supposed to be going on in the junior high classroom. And if you stop and correct each one of those, we'll never get to the lesson that's supposed to be taught. So I learned to keep teaching, but snap my fingers and it kind of gets everybody's attention. And by the way, it worked this morning. Some of you who weren't paying attention, I snapped my fingers and it worked, okay? I look at that verse and that verse to me is almost like God's snap of the fingers. He knows that we want to be blessed. And so God says, if you want to be blessed, Look into the perfect law of liberty. Continue it therein. Don't be a forgetful hearer, but do what I tell you to do, and you'll be blessed. Probably, whatever God says after he gets all of our attention is pretty important. God just said, hey, everybody listen. And by the way, if you listen and you don't forget what I'm about to tell you, you'll be blessed in your deed. Well, probably whatever he tells us next is pretty important. What does he say next? If you seem to be religious and you don't control your tongue, your religion is vain. Pure religion before God and the Father is this, that you visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. There are people who need our help. Do you help them? Do you assist them? That is one of the ingredients 
of God's definition of pure religion. This benevolent spirit that helps those who need help. How do you help others? Personally, how in your life do you assist others? You know, tragically, sometimes we hear a sermon like this or we hear a question like that. And that benevolent spirit, if we were honest, that benevolent spirit oftentimes goes to that person at work or it goes to that down and out person that needs our help. You know that person at work, that down and out person that needs our help? I think God expects us to help them. But does that benevolent spirit, does that manifest itself in your home? Does that benevolent spirit manifest itself towards your relationship with your spouse? How about to your children? You know, sometimes those of us that are kind to a perfect stranger are unkind and impatient with that person that we promised on a platform that we would love and cherish them. You understand an an unsaved world, when they look at those of us that seem to be religious and they don't see that benevolent spirit in our homes, they kind of scratch their head and it doesn't make sense to them. As importantly, I have six children, five of whom now live in my home. One of them is married and had the audacity to move out, okay? But those children that live in our homes, we seem to be religious. We drag them to church. We make sure they're at vacation Bible school. We make sure they're at church on Sunday morning. Do they see that benevolent spirit when they need help? Boy, sometimes the needs of a child if we allow them to, they can be frustrating. They can be irritating. You know, I don't know who, I don't know who said it or who taught us that uh, from ages 0 to 10, there's training. Then from 10 to 12, there's retraining. If you have a junior higher, you can say amen to that. And then ages 12 to 18 is restraining. And if you have a teenager, you might say amen to that. And I don't know who said that, but years ago I heard them say that, and I've watched that play out. There's a lot of training that has to take place in a seven-year-old, in an eight-year-old, in a ten-year-old. Sometimes as a parent, that can be frustrating and you lose your benevolent spirit. Some of us that are able to maintain that benevolent spirit through ten years of age, welcome to having a junior high young person that lives in your home. And that retraining can be very irritating. And then comes the teenage years as a parent. Make sure that our benevolent spirit Is not only in a church house, not only at the workplace, but make sure it's at home. Make sure it makes a difference in our own homes, because if it doesn't, that religion doesn't make sense to the Lord. Pure religion is a bridal tongue. Pure religion is a benevolent spirit. Many times as a child, didn't you need a benevolent spirit? I remember on one occasion, my oldest brother, John, received for Christmas this contraption that was supposed to be some sort of an exercise machine. And when I say machine, it had these two blue handles and it had five bungee cords that connected these two blue handles. And it had this manual that seemed to be about 300 pages with a million and one exercises that you can do with two blue handles and five bungee cords, okay? And he got this for Christmas. And I don't know how long it took until it ended up down in the basement, okay? And I remember being down in the basement and slipping one foot into one of those handles and pulling up with all of my might on the other handle. And I was probably, I'm, I'm guessing, six, seven, eight years of age. And this is the honest truth. At that exact moment, my father looked over my shoulder. And you can probably guess where this is going. And that's where it went. That thing slipped off of my foot and smacked my dad right, right in the nose. Hit him right in the nose. And I remember the look that he gave me. Now, the look was not one of benevolent spirit, okay? (laughs) But luckily, he had a bridal tongue, okay? He got through number one in his religion, okay? But the look he gave me was that, was probably the stupidest thing I've ever seen a human being do, okay? However, I remember him looking at me and then turning around and walking up the stairs. And I remember thinking, you know, I thought they were going to find my body and I'll you know, separate dumpsters around Lake County. Uh, You know what? I needed some patience. You have a spouse who needs you. You have children who need you. 
You have those in your life that look to you who know you're a Christian. Do they see a benevolent spirit? And you know, more importantly than all of that, each of those are important. But more importantly, we have a Heavenly Father that so loves us. And He expects us to love one another. That is a way, He tells us in 1 John, that we love Him. He even says, if you say you love me and you don't love one another, you are a liar. I wouldn't say that to you this morning. That's unkind. But God says that to us. That benevolent spirit. The bridal tongue, a benevolent spirit. And lastly, verse 27 talks about a blameless testimony. It says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. What, what does that mean to you? What does that mean? Where God says, if you seem to be religious, let me tell you my definition. Show your mouth, you have a benevolent spirit towards other people, and you keep yourself, not the church body, you keep your personal self unspotted from the world. And I'm so seriously, I'm asking you the question. I remember Dr. Boyd teaching us, you make a statement. He was principal at Hammond Baptist, and in talking to teachers, he would say, you make a statement, that statement, I'm sorry, somebody wasn't paying attention, and the junior high snap came out. Okay, if you make a statement, Brother Boyd used to say, you make a statement, it causes the audience to analyze you. You ask a question, it causes the, anal- the audience to analyze themselves. And I'm really, I'm, I'm seeking to analyze this verse. What does the Lord mean when he says, if you seem to be religious, one of the three ingredients is you keep yourself unspotted from the world. Again, I ask the question, what does that mean? What does it mean as Brother Wilkerson has preached to us from Romans chapter 12, where Romans chapter 12 says, be not conformed to this world. What does that mean? What does it mean when the Lord says, come out from among them and be ye separate? What does it mean when the Lord says, you know what? If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So what does that mean? I think you understand. I think the Lord expects us to be different from the world. Would you agree with that? In a day and age when churches and religion and and even good people who seem to be religious are kind of scratching their head when it comes to separation and saying, you know what, I I don't know if that's really all that important. Really? Because out of everything that God could have chosen to say after he snapped his fingers and got our attention, one of those three things is, look it, you're supposed to be unspotted from the world. Evidently, that's pretty important to God. And if we really are looking to align our definition of what religion should be with the Lord's, you cannot dismiss that one. You can't. There is the world and worldliness. There is the Lord and holiness. And we're somewhere in between those two. I don't think when we get to heaven, we're going to be disappointed if we were closer to the Lord and holiness than we were to the world and worldliness. I just don't think so. You know, some of us that grew up in this church, or we grew up in a Christian home, we grew up in a good place, Some of the first things we learned are those rules, if you want to call them the rules of religion or the rules of separation. We learned those right off, even before we had a relationship with the Lord. And sometimes we learn to separate from the world, but we never combine that, you know what, not only are we supposed to be separating from the world, but we're supposed to be separating unto the Lord. Some of us, we never started looking at, the, at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Sometimes just by sheer character and willpower, we're trying to separate from the world. But the whole time, we're kind of watching the world like, well, why can't I do that? And what's wrong with that? And why can't I do this? Right? Because many of us, we grew up in a Christian home, and before we even had a relationship with the Lord, 
We knew certain things were right to say, certain things were wrong to say. Certain greeting cards you could look at, and certain greeting cards you weren't supposed to look at. And we learned at a very young age, this morning, I was talking with the Novaks, LJ and Amy, and little Lucy is three, and she comes into Sunday school. And Lucy trusted Christ as her Savior this week. Went through, and you know, she's three years of age, and whether or not she reached the age of accountability, well, I guess... We'll find out, but we'll see just a little girl who is concerned about her salvation, and she asked her mom, are there TVs in heaven? And Amy said, I'm not sure. And Lucy said, well, we better take ours then. You know, they, they learn real fast what's important. And by the way, they learn real fast. There's things we can watch on TV. There's things we can't watch on TV, right? Even before they know that there's a heavenly father who loved them and died for them. And even before they understand that, you know, one reason I keep his commandments is because 1 John chapter 5 tells me, for this is the love of God, that you keep my commandments, and that my commandments are not grievous unto you. You know, somehow in our house, there's this person that I share the bedroom with, but somehow, whenever that person is hot or cold, do you know whose responsibility it is to get up and adjust the thermostat? Yeah. Why is that mine? Is that just man's work or something? You know? Now, I do that if my wife is cold or she's hot. Now, I saw couples look at one another. Brother Grafton, is that your job? Is that, Chris Grafton, is that right? See? I feel your pain back there, okay? But God says, though, if, and I'm not preaching to the Graftons, I'm preaching to myself, or a way that we show love, that I can show love to my wife, is, honey, I would love to get up and adjust that thermostat for you. That's not grievous, although she just found out. It is. It's very grievous. I think the person who's hot or cold should get up and adjust the thermostat. That is a way that I can show love in a way that Brother Grafton shows his love, his love, <laughs> his love to his life, his love to his wife by getting up and adjusting the thermostat, okay? But some of us, when it comes to the commands of God, we don't put two and two together. Hey, those of us that grew up in Christianity, Christian young people, you realize that being unspotted from the world, that's important to God. Is turning the thermostat down important to me? Not really. I'm quite comfortable. But since it's important to her, that's fine. There really isn't a problem. Those items of separation to a Christian who is just separating from. It's easy to look at the world and worldliness and say, why can't I do that? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with this? Than it is to realize there's a God who loves me and this is an opportunity that I have to show him that I love him. Let me ask you a question. Where are you on this scale? If that's what I have illustrated here, the world and worldliness and the Lord and holiness where are you on the scale? As a church, you know, not everybody should go to the First Baptist Church of Hammond. It'd be real tough to fit billions of people that are on the planet in this building. We'd have to build bigger. I understand that. It'd be hard to commute from Australia. But if you, God takes you to another church, does that church take you closer to the Lord, closer to holiness? Be careful about those decisions in your life what you allow in your own house, in your own life, those, in the area of separation. I couldn't just gloss over that one this morning. If we're going to talk about pure religion, according to God's three ingredients, you've got to be able to control your tongue. You've got to have a benevolent spirit and look to help others. And you have to be, have a blameless testimony. You have to be unspotted from the world. This summer I was, I had an opportunity to, to tour for a week with one of the tour groups, and there's an outstanding tour group, five young ladies, and, and just did a tremendous job, enjoyed listening to them sing, always did a terrific job, but they messed up once, and it was, it was pretty funny. The, the, the young lady, and some of you know her, Dora uh, Keegan, or Kagan, Keegan, if you don't know, if you know Dora, then I'm just about to embarrass her, so let her know that I talked about her, but Dora introduced this song, Okay, that she was going to sing with, with her tour group, and there's four ladies and, and the piano player. And she introduced the song, but that's not the song they were supposed to sing next. 
So after she introduced, talked about, you know, the, about her testimony, and then she was going to sing this song that goes along with her testimony, the piano player started playing the song that they were supposed to sing next. But Dora sang the song that she introduced, okay? Now, I don't know music. I really don't know much about music. And I was sitting there on the front row, and, uh, you know, the song was being, being played by Victoria Turner, the, the piano player, and Dora started singing the other song, and even though I don't know music, I looked at that, listened to that, and I knew, hey, there's something wrong with that, you know? And then I looked at the faces of the other three girls, and they're like, mm. you know, they're looking like, ah, okay. And you know what? They just had to put on the brakes, and the piano player and the singer had to get on the same page, otherwise we were going to endure. Uh, it, it, it just didn't sound very well, okay? Even from somebody who doesn't know music. And I think sometimes we have an unsaved world that looks at those of us that seem to be religious. And they may not know a lot about the Bible, but sometimes they look at religious people and they scratch their head and say, you know, that just doesn't seem right. I think that's why God very specifically says, if you seem to be religious, you're going to control what you say. You will have a benevolent spirit. I don't think it's just to everybody out there. I think it reaches into our homes and you will have a blameless testimony. This week we enjoyed Vacation Bible School, and years ago, actually, I was, I was just a baby. Uh, I was born in March, and that summer, a lady came to our house named Mrs. Morgan, who, just, who was really a neighbor, and invited my four older brothers and sisters to Bible school, just like we had this week. And at the end of Bible school, just like we did this week, the parents were invited and encouraged to come, and my mom and dad went to a little church in St. John, Indiana, to see what Bible school was all about, all about, because that evening they were invited. Many of you remember Pastor John Hanks, who pastored over in Sauk Village for many years. Uh, Brother John Hanks preached that night, and my dad still remembers the message. I've heard him tell about the message many times. He preached on the old man, and when the sermon was done, he had the whole audience walk by a casket, and they're talking about, again, putting away the old man, and when you looked in the casket, there was a mirror, and so you saw yourself in the casket, and it was supposed to symbolize, you know, getting rid of the old man, or, I don't know, it sounds kind of scary to me, okay, but that was that sermon, and that sermon was presented to save people, just like this sermon was talking to people that are religious. James starts out by saying, brethren, in the opening paragraph there of the book of James, James is talking to save people, but my parents weren't saved, and because of that visit to that little church, Sometime later, John Hanks' brother, a man by the name of Roger Hanks, and another soul winner knocked on my parents' door, I think on a Monday evening, they were watching the Waltons on a Monday evening, and interrupted the Waltons. My dad came to the door, Brother Roger Hanks said, you know, you attended this church, and we want to thank you for coming. Your kids attended vacation Bible school. Brother Woosley, I want to ask you a question. Do you know for sure, if you died today, that you would go to heaven? And my dad looked back at Roger Hanks, and said, sir, I don't, I don't think anybody can know that for sure. And Brother Roger Hanks opened his Bible to 1 John chapter 5, where the Bible says, these things have I written unto you, and it says that ye may know that you have eternal life. And my dad was an honest man. He looked at that Bible verse and said, well, I'm wrong and you're right. How do I know that? And that man showed my dad from the Bible how he could know for sure he was going to heaven. My parents trusted Christ that evening, and as an infant, that soul winner changed my future and changed the life of my family. Let me ask you that question this morning. Do you know that for sure? And maybe you were thinking like my dad thought 40 years ago, I don't think you can know that for sure. The Bible says you can. And if you don't know that for sure, we'd like to show you that this morning. The sermon was taken right from the scriptures this morning to religious people. And I didn't talk much to the unsaved. But if you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, in just a moment, I'm going to pray, and then we'll all, we will stand. The men on the platform and some, some other men will be down at the front of each aisle. They'll be standing there facing the wrong way. Okay, you'll be able to tell who they are. So if you want to trust Christ as your Savior and you want somebody to take a Bible and show you that, how you can know for sure from the Bible, they'll show you exactly what my dad was shown years ago. If you'd like somebody to show that to you, then this morning after I finish praying and we all stand, Please leave your seat. Come right down the aisle. And let somebody show you that. Take care of that this morning. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege that's ours to be a Christian. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given each of us to attend, to attend church this morning, to open up the scriptures, to have a copy of the Bible, and to be able to talk about things of you. Lord, I, make, I pray it'd make a difference. I pray that we wouldn't allow pride to allow us to want to mess up the religion as outlined in scripture. I pray we would just work to follow you with our lives, work to be the examples that we should be, work to be the Christians that you had in mind when you created us. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, how many of you would say, you know, Brother Wooza, I know that. I know that I'm going to heaven when I die. That's all settled. Would you lift your hand if you say, I know that I'm going to heaven when I die? Thank you very much. Put your hands down. If when I ask that question, if you couldn't raise your hand, please let us help you with that this morning. There's no pressure. We'd simply open up the Bible. We wouldn't tell you our opinion, just like I tried to do this morning. We will open the Bible, and we will show you exactly from Scripture what the Lord says, how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. If you say, you know, Brother Wooster, I don't know that, but I would like to. Would you raise your hand this morning? Is there anybody like that? Yes, sir. Anybody else like that? Yes, sir, I see those. If that's you, in just a moment, I'm going to have everybody stand. Please leave your seat where you are. Come right down the aisle, and somebody will show you from the, from the Bible how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for the many blessings we have. We certainly don't deserve them. Please bless Pastor as he's away. Please be with our church. Bless the remainder of our service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.